You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. David Michael Kruger is best known by his birth name, Peter Woodcock, and he is known as Canada's youngest serial killer. By the time that his life ended in 2010, he was known as a serial killer, a child rapist, and was also a diagnosed psychopath. Peter is known for crimes that actually took place many, many years apart, as he would initially be incarcerated for three murders of young children in Toronto in the late 1950s. However, one of the most jarring things about Peter was that he would also commit murder in 1991 on his very first day of unsupervised release from the institution that he had been held in. Hello, and welcome to episode 54 of Gone But Never Forgotten, Peter Woodcock, Canada's Youngest and Uncurable Serial Killer. Hello everyone and welcome back to GBNF. This week I will be flying solo. Last week we covered the 1971 riot inside of Kingston Penitentiary and in our reaction video for our patrons we got into the conversation about the death penalty in Canada and the way that people that do things to children are the worst of the worst and as I put it they should not be allowed to have even a chance at being released back into the public at all. So this week, I figured that we would back that up by sharing a harrowing tale of a man who was a serial killer and a rapist of children, and who was allowed to see the light of day on the outside again, only to prove to be, as the title of this episode says, uncurable. You can pick your own narrative when you're putting these shows together, what can I say? I wanted to drive my point home and show just how disgusting someone can be that brings harm in any way to children. These cases that cover anything with children are very difficult. It makes for an even more sad episode than usual. As Julie put it in our last reaction episode, even criminals have a code that they live by, and they too view people like Peter Woodcock as the true and ultimate scum of the earth. I dare anyone to disagree with us when we get to the end of this case. Peter Woodcock was born on March 5, 1939 in Peterborough, Ontario, to Whitehall Woodcock, who was a 17-year-old factory worker. Whitehall would breastfeed Peter for a month and then give him up for adoption. Dealing with him was difficult and she knew very well that she could not provide for him. Early adoption records would list him, though, as being a newborn and it was noted that he had issues being fed and he cried incessantly. For the first three years of his life, young Peter would be shuttled around from foster home to foster home. It was said that around the time of his first birthday, he started to show that he was afraid of anyone else approaching him. His speech was incoherent, and it was documented that rather than words, Peter would use strange noises that sounded like animal sounds. As noted, Peter also cried incessantly. Unfortunately, as we do hear about far too often, it's been noted that Peter was physically abused at a very young age by at least one of his foster parents. Peter would be taken to the hospital at the age of two, 
because of a twisted neck after he was beaten by said foster parent. Things seemed to change a bit in Peter's fortunes at the age of three. He finally found a stable and permanent home with Frank and Susan Maynard. Frank and Susan were a wealthy couple that lived in the Young Street and Lawrence Avenue area of Toronto. They spent a lot of money trying to help Peter out. They paid for therapists, private schools, expensive bikes, and toys for young Peter trying to help him adjust and trying to help him to overcome the issues that he had already been through in his very young life. By the age of five, it was said that Peter would finally stop crying when people approached him. However, it was noted that he was still described by anyone that knew him as a small and strange boy. It was also said that he generally did not get along well with other people. I want to pause for a quick moment here to remind everyone that Peter's young life is taking place in the 1940s. Times, as we often say here on the show, were very different. To the trained eye, it honestly sounds like Peter would be dealing with trauma from his early life, but I also would venture to say that he likely was somewhere on what we now know as the autism spectrum. A lot of the things that he was going through, like lack of speech, hiding and crying, strange noises, and distrust certainly sound like things that could be attributed to autism or another disorder. There's little doubt that young Peter, and by extension Peter in general, had gone through a lot and likely was dealing with a lot of problems that were perhaps not as well known about in that time. We talked in our last episode a bit about having remorse for criminals, and even though we said that in large part we don't, when we go through some of the things that Peter and other serial killers that we have covered have gone through, sometimes it is easy to feel at least a little bit of remorse. Especially when maybe they grew up in a time where there was not as much knowledge and aid available for disorders that they may have had. I do feel badly when I hear about stuff like this because perhaps if Peter was born now, as opposed to then, he may have had a completely different story. However, I think that the sadness starts to drop off in a hurry as we get more into his story. By the age of five, Peter was already facing a lot of bullying as he was still not socially adjusted and obviously still faced a lot of issues. Frank and Susan would bring Peter to the hospital for sick children in Toronto often because they wanted to help him to live as normal of a life as possible and because they were very worried about how fragile Peter was emotionally. As mentioned, Peter would also be sent to private school in hopes that he would not face as much of the strife that public school can provide. Peter, though, failed to make friends really with anyone and remained mostly isolated. By the age of 11, documentation from the Children's Aid Society said that he was, quote, an angry little boy, unquote. The report went on to describe Peter's personality and actions in the following way, quote, slight in build, neat in appearance, eyes bright and wide open, worried facial expression, sometimes screwing up of the eyes, walks briskly and erect, moves rapidly, darts ahead, interested, and questioning, constantly in conversation. He attributes his wandering to feeling so nervous that he just has to get away. In some ways, Peter has little capacity for self-control. He appears to act out almost everything that he thinks and demonstrates excessive affection for his foster mother. Although he verbalizes his resentment for other children, he has never been known to physically attack another child. Peter apparently has no friends. He plays occasionally with younger children, managing the play. When with children his own age, he is boastful and expresses determinedly ideas which are unacceptable and misunderstood, unquote. As we can see, Peter was a very troubled little boy. 
He didn't trust anyone, really, and was only capable of playing with younger children because he was able to take a leadership role over the children rather than just play with them. Around this time would be when violent fantasies would begin to be a part of Peter's life as well. While walking through the Canadian National Exhibition, or CNE, with a social worker, he told the worker that he wished that a bomb would fall on the X and kill all of the children. All of this would lead to another drastic change in Peter's life. He would be sent to a school that was for emotionally disturbed children in Kingston, Ontario. This, of course, would take him away from his home life and his foster parents. As mentioned, it was documented that Peter was very affectionate with his mother, so I'm sure that this was likely another source of abandonment issues for Peter. Not to put blame on anyone, it is pretty obvious that he needed this kind of help. But after already having abandonment issues because of being given up by his birth mother, amongst other issues, you could see how this was not going to be helpful for Peter inside of his own head. While at the school, Peter would start to act out on the strong sexual urges that he already had at a very young age. He said that he had consensual sex with a 12-year-old girl when he was 13 at the school. Then, when he was 15, he would return home to Toronto to again live with his foster parents. He would again be enrolled at a private school, but when that seemed to not work out for him, Peter was removed from private school and he was sent to a public high school. Unfortunately for Peter, though, the kids that used to bully him as a young child recognized him immediately, and he would continue to be bullied. He transferred back again to a private school after only six weeks in public school. Peter would continue to be bullied and shunned, but it also his teachers at the private school recall Peter as being bright and an excellent student. He especially excelled in science, history, and English, and he often would get 100% on his tests. As Peter grew up and hit puberty, his favorite thing in the world was his bicycle, a red and white Schwinn bike. His bike gave him the ability to wander further and faster, which was very appealing to him and his imagination. He rode his bike quite a distance in the city of Toronto, even during the winter. His parents were aware of his need to wander and even of fantasies that he started to have, but they were not aware of everything that was going on. The fantasy that his parents were aware of was that he was the leader of a bicycle gang of 500 invisible boys that he called the Winchester Heights Gang. What they were not aware of, however, was the fact that he was sexually assaulting children as he was wandering the city on his bike. Peter had become enthralled with the human body. He had multiple books at home that he would study, and those would feed into his sexual desires, which were getting darker and darker every day. Peter would often offer his bicycle rides to children that he met on his travels, when he, and when he got them out of sight of everyone else, he would assault them. He would choke them unconscious and undress them. At times, he would simply look at them or play doctor with them while they were unconscious, and other times he would sexually assault them. This is the kind of thing that we talk about with our children as parents at length. You never know how you will come across someone that cannot be trusted, and you certainly never know who they will be. All you can do is be safe. Oftentimes, the people that do the most damage to others are very good at pretending to be soft and innocent. Just a simple bike ride led to many children likely having emotional trauma that would last them a lifetime. On September 15, 1956, though, Peter escalated in a very dark way. He was riding his bike around the grounds at Exhibition Place when he came across a seven-year-old boy by the name of Wayne Mallett. Peter would lure Wayne out of the sight of other people and then proceed to strangle Wayne to death. 
Wayne's body would be found early the next morning on September 16th. It appeared to investigators that his clothing had been removed and then put back on the boy. His face was shoved into the dirt and there were two bite marks found on his body. One bite mark was on the boy's calf and the other was on his buttocks. There was, however, no evidence of rape. Pennies were found scattered all around the body of Wayne, and there were also there was also excrement found beside Wayne's body. When Peter was leaving the scene of the crime, he actually spoke with a security guard and told him that he had seen someone that looked similar to himself running away from the area. Police would initially arrest and interrogate another boy, Ron Moffat, for the crime. They questioned and interrogated Ron so relentlessly that Ron actually confessed to the murder. At the time, Ron was 14. A huge part of the problem with the case against Ron was that there were multiple people that corroborated that he was actually at a movie theater before, during, and after the murder of Wayne. Nonetheless, Ron would be found guilty and sentenced to youth detention. This is crazy to me, and I'm sure to many of you as well. We're again back to that difference in time. Nowadays, police could eliminate suspects and perhaps even find out who murdered young Wayne by the bite marks or by the, de the defecation that was left at the scene of the crime. However, back then, as we've sadly seen far too many times on this podcast already, police latched onto a suspect and ran with it. It's very much like the Lynn Harper and Stephen Truscott case that we covered in episode 49, where the police just seemed to believe that they had the right person, regardless of what the evidence said. In that episode, we hypothesized that maybe it was because it was on the Canadian Forces base, but obviously it happened a lot more than just there. Unfortunately, in this case, for sure, because of that determination, more children were going to lose their lives. Three weeks after Wayne's murder, a nine-year-old boy named Gary Morris would be picked up in Cabbage Town in Toronto by Peter. Peter would ride with Gary to Cherry Beach, where he strangled and beat Gary to death. A coroner would later deem that Gary Morris died from a ruptured liver. Gary's body was discovered with a bite mark on his throat, and paper clips sprinkled near the corpse, much like the pennies. Again, it was noted that clothing had been removed from Gary, and then Gary had been dressed again. Seemingly, Peter would go through a long pause in his attacks, or at least the murders. However, on January 19th, 1957, he would indeed strike again. Peter was riding his bike, and he approached a young four-year-old girl named Carol Voice. Once again, he offered her a ride on his bike, and this time he would drive her under the Bluer viaduct, and that is where he killed her. Her clothing had been pulled off when she was found, and it appeared as though she had been choked unconscious and sexually assaulted. Her death was caused by a tree branch, that was forcibly inserted into her vagina. This was an escalation even for someone that had already murdered before. It's absolutely appalling and even hard to just read those words, let alone imagine what that poor girl went through. I don't think that you can hear about something like that and not feel sick to your stomach. Thankfully, if you can use a word like that in a situation like this, there were witnesses that saw a teenager riding away from the scene of the murder this time, and investigators were able to put together a composite sketch based on those descriptions. That sketch would be on the front page of the Toronto Star and would lead to the arrest of Peter only two days later on January 21st of 1957. At the time of his arrest, he stated that he wasn't afraid of the police or the law. The thing that he was the most afraid of was his foster mother after she found out what he had done. 
Once he found out that the police were not going to let her get at him, he confessed to all three murders. Ultimately, Peter would only be tried for the murder of Carol, Carol Voice, and after only a four-day trial, he was found to be not guilty for the murder by reason of insanity. He was subsequently sent to the Oak Ridge Division of the Maximum Security Penetanguishene Mental Health Center in Penetanguishene, Ontario. Peter would then be diagnosed as a psychopath. That is a distinction that came with a lot of leeway for doctors back then, as that essentially meant that the person in question could, and would, be treated essentially like a guinea pig. Peter arrived at Penetanguishene just as psychiatrists were trying to find ways to cure psychopathic offenders. In the 1960s and 70s, that meant one of the drugs that were used on Peter was LSD. Peter would also participate in something that was called the 100-Day Hate-In, where a group of psychopaths were shoved into a room together in an attempt to force them to develop empathy. Aside from LSD, Peter would also be given other very powerful drugs, and he was also forced to live inside of a giant artificial womb for days on end. Some of the other drugs that were used on Peter are what are known as personality-breaking drugs. Scopolamine, sodium amytal, methadrine, and dexamil. None of these treatments would prove useful with Peter, and he in fact continued to show the same issues that had led him to murder and to incarceration in the first place. While at Panatanguishin, he coerced other patients into sexual acts and also exploited many of the other inmates. The other inmates were generally deemed as less intelligent and less sane than Peter was. Peter would even convince the other inmates that he was part of a gang called the Brotherhood on the outside, and he convinced them that if they wanted to be initiated in the Brotherhood, they needed to give him oral sex and bring him cigarettes. Eventually, it was deemed that Peter, or David Michael Kruger, as he had legally changed his name to, was not going to be cured. He was transferred to less restrictive institutions, and ultimately he would wind up at the Brockville Psychiatric Hospital, where he w when he was there, the staff actually would take him out on short trips out. Peter had a love for trains, so they took him to the Smith Falls Railway Museum, and they actually even took him to watch the movie The Silence of the Lambs. During the same time, Peter rekindled a relationship with a man named Bruce Hamill. Bruce was a killer from Ottawa that was working security at the Ottawa courthouse. Bruce had also been re released from Penetanguishene. Peter would convince Bruce that an alien brotherhood would solve all of his problems if he would help Peter kill Dennis Kerr, another inmate with, P with Peter at Brockville. On July 13, 1991, Hamill went to a hardware store and bought a plumber's wrench, a hatchet, knives, and a sleeping bag. From there, he went to Brockville Hospital and signed out Peter Woodcock on his very first escorted day pass. This was indeed his first time on the outside unsupervised since 1957 when he was arrested. So, if you're keeping track, that's 34 years. Within one hour of being on the outside, Peter and Bruce would meet up with Dennis by telling him that they were going to loan him $500. The two men would ambush Dennis, killing him and mutilating his body. After they killed Dennis, the two men would sodomize his corpse as well. Peter would then calmly put his jacket back on and leave Bruce at the scene of the crime to turn himself in. Bruce, on the other hand, took a handful of sleeping pills and waited for the aliens to come and save him. Peter would be sent back to Penetang, the maximum security institution where he would spend the final 18 years of his life. 
As he grew older, he looked frail and spent his time following Toronto news closely and listening to shortwave radio broadcasts. He never again left the barred doors and double locks of Penetang. He had no family, and his death was reported to his lawyer on March 5th of 2010 by another serial killer. He died of natural causes. Before his death, he was the focus of a documentary called Mind of a Murderer. Season 1, Episode 2 was called The Mask of Sanity and focused on Peter Woodcock. And that is where we will leave it for this week. After you finish this episode, please come over to patreon.com forward slash GBNF podcast and join me for the reaction video. I'm going to discuss many things about this case, and I would imagine that we, I will largely center on the fact that Peter was even allowed to be released on a day pass in the first place. There certainly were a lot of warning signs pertaining to Peter Woodcock, and it's worth noting that he estimated that he had sexually assaulted 100 children before he started to murder. I imagine the reaction video will be another good one like last week. Remember that you can check out our reaction videos by signing up on Patreon to any of our tiers. You can sign up as a listener for $1.50 a month. You can be a supporter for $3 per month, an obsessor for $7 per month, or a partner for $10 a month. There are many other perks for each level, but I think that four reaction videos a month is already well worth that price of admission. So join us over there, show some support for the podcast that you love, and get a bunch more content. Until next week, be better. And don't forget to come back for the next episode of Gone But Never Forgotten.